All right, welcome everybody to this Tile Talk meeting today. And we would like to welcome Dr. Brett Jones from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University from in the US. Um, he's going to talk about engaging students by creating a positive motivational climate. Brett Jones is a professor in the Educational Psychology Program in the School of Education at Virginia Tech. He has held faculty positions as an educational psychologist at Duke University, the University of South Florida, St. Um, Petersburg, and Virginia Tech. He has taught 24 different types of university courses related to motivation, cognition, and teaching strategies. And Dr. Jones has also conducted workshops and invited presentations at many universities and has presented over 160 research papers at conferences. His research, which includes examining instructional methods that support students' motivation and learning, has led to more than 100 refer refereed journal articles, several book chapters, and three books. He has received three grants from the National Science Foundation for a total of over two million to conduct his research. Welcome um, to the Tile Network. I'm going to hand over to you right now. As always, feel free to ask any questions or leave any comments in the chat, and then we will work through them as we um, progress. Super. Well, thank you so much, Carolina, for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone. Let me switch over here to share my screen. That should work well. Well, thanks again. I'm excited to be here today and have the opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes. And thanks for taking time at the end of your day um, to join us. I, I'm gonna get this working right, there we go. As Carolina said, I'm um, Brett Jones. I'm a motivation scientist and educational psychologist at Virginia Tech. And for those of you who may or may not know much about educational psychology, it's the study of teaching and learning. We use a phrase over here a little bit different, actually, than you all use the term typically, I think, in the UK, where, where um, what you call educational psychology is more what we call school psychology. And so as an educational psychologist, um, we focus more on teaching and learning and not as much on working in the schools with um, helping students to um, diagnose issues. Uh, but you'll see some of that come out here as I explain things during my talk. I've been teaching courses and uh, researching student motivation since about 1999. And for the last 13 years or so, I've been at Virginia Tech and I enjoy it here. And so today I wanted to talk about creating a positive motivational climate. And so the first thing I think we should think about is what is motivational climate? Because <laughs> it's not uh, necessarily clear, especially to some of you who are in some other fields. And so the way I define it is that the aspects of the psychological environment that affects students' motivation and engagement within a course. Okay, that might make some sense, but you might also be wondering what are motivation and engagement? These are terms that you all have heard before and know and use, uh, but the question is what, how do I use them and how do we use them in our field of educational psychology? We consider motivation the extent to which one intends to engage in an activity. So you haven't actually engaged in it yet, but you intend to, you're motivated to, to engage. Um, there's a lot of things that you're probably motivated to do that you intend to do, but you know you have a to-do list and you do some of them before others for a lot of different reasons. Uh, that motivation then leads to engagement of some of those things. And by engagement, we're talking about behavioral engagement. You show up, you raise your hand, you, you participate. Also cognitive engagement. So you're thinking about it. You're, you're, um, you're using strategies. You're intentionally um, being mindful. Maybe you're using self-regulated learning and metacognitive strategies. So you can engage in different ways, behaviorally and cognitively. And if you do so, that should lead to higher uh, outcomes, such as higher learning and, and better performance. So motivational climate comes before this in my model because students' perceptions of these five factors, empowerment, usefulness, success, interest, and caring, 
create the motivational climate. Scientists, motivational scientists and educational psychologists for about 30, 40, 50 years have found that these five factors really set the stage for whether students are gonna be motivated or not in classes. So we need to consider these five things. And so in the music model of motivation, we use the acronym music to help us remember these things uh, because I don't always have the best memory. And so you can see here uh, that the initial sounds of each of these words form the acronym music where empowerment is about students having the ability to make decisions about their learning. They feel like they're in control of their learning. Usefulness refers to students understanding why the instruction is useful for their goals in life. How is it beneficial to them? How is it relevant? Success refers to students' beliefs that they can succeed if they put forth the effort. And interest is what you think it is. They're interested in the content and in the instructional activities, and maybe they're emotionally engaged. They get excited about it. They're not bored. Um, and finally, caring is about the relationships with others in the learning environment such as relationships between the student and a teacher, and as well as between other students, if that's a part of the learning environment and course. So these five factors then make up the motivational climate. And this is all part of a bigger model that I'm just gonna explain to you pretty briefly here to give you a broad overview. And so these are external variables, such as instructors teaching strategies, and the instructor can use music strategies, and other environmental conditions like students' family, their peers, the culture that they're in, the society they're in, the broader world that they live in. All these things affect students' perceptions within a course, some more than others, of course. But there's also internal variables. And typically, these are the things psychologists study, right? Cognition, um, some of you probably study these things, your thoughts, your beliefs, your goals, your values. Affect, things like your emotions and moods, your needs and desires. Your identity, who are you as a person? And your personality characteristics, which tend to be more stable over time, such as introversion, extroversion, openness, and these types of things that psychologists have identified. So these things interact in complex ways, right? It's hard to just say that this thing affects this and this, and it's that simple. We know it's really complex. <laughs> But we try to get our arms around it as motivation scientists and educational psychologists that try to make sense of some of this and understand some of these factors at different points. Because this is a cycle. So these perceptions lead to motivation and engagement and outcomes, which then um, cycle back. So how well you do at something then informs whether you think you're good at it. Do you have higher self-efficacy? Do you like this thing? And that affects how other people interact with you, this arrow that goes up and down here. Um, so external variables are affected by internal variables and, and these things interact in complex ways then to affect students' perceptions in a course. Now, there's other things going on too. If that wasn't complex enough, there's other things in students' lives, believe it or not, right? They, they may be motivated to play video games, to hang out with their friends, to do all sorts of things. So they have a lot of other motivations for other activities and they engage in other activities. So students are making cost-benefit decisions all the time, right? Am I going to study tonight? Am I going to go to class? Am I going to do this reading? Am I going to do this assignment? So they're constantly making cost-benefit decisions in terms of what they want to do in relation to all of these activities that they're motivated to do. Um, and so the music model is aware of all these things. But what we say is that instructors have control over this part. You don't have control over a lot of the other parts of this model, do you? But as an instructor, we do have control over the strategies that we use in our teaching. To some extent, you know, we might not even have 100% control over that. Okay, but we have a pretty good um, control over it if you're the, the instructor of a course or co-instructor. And so that's where the focus of the music model is. And so the, the focus of the music model is to say, how do instructors create a positive motivational climate? Because these are things that we can affect which then affects students' perceptions. And we, again, we can't control everything, but let's control what we can control. And uh, as a result, create a positive motivational climate, which then keeps students motivated, gets them engaged. And ultimately we want students to learn more and perform better. I mean, motivation is great, but if students aren't learning more, then um, often that's, that's not gonna be acceptable. Most courses are designed obviously to improve learning. 
and performance in something. They say, well, that's great, Brett. How do you do this? What, type, what are you talking about? What are our empowerment strategies? So I have a whole book on this and a whole chapter on each of these strategies that I pulled together from other people. These aren't just my ideas. Um, I pulled together the research from other people into one place. And so let me give you a flavor of those today. So what I wanna do in the next 10 or 15 minutes, give you a flavor of some of these strategies. Let me go back. Flavor of some strategies that you can use um, to affect students' perceptions. And then I'll talk about how to incorporate that in a broader design. And then I'll end with an assessment and how you can assess these students' perceptions. And if we have time, I'll share a little bit of my research with you, but that's not uh, the primary focus of the talk today. So what do you mean by empowerment strategies? Well, let me give you a few examples. Again, these are just examples in broad categories. The most obvious one is to provide choices. And there's a lot of ways you can do this. You could give students different assignments to choose from. It tends to be a little bit harder to do. Some people do it. Um, you can have the same assignment for all the students, but have choices within an assignment. Typically a little bit easier to do and manage. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could have students, you could have the same assignment, but have them show their knowledge in different ways, maybe by a, a blog or a vlog or uh, a written paper or a video or, so this is where you can be creative and having some of those choices can sometimes get students more mo motivated. It's not the only thing, it doesn't work all the time necessarily, but this is, I'm trying to give you strategies that can be used and you have to decide as a professional instructor whether they're right for your teaching and your situation. That's one type of thing you can do. Any type of learner directed approach you use. So for instance, any of you use problem-based learning, project-based learning, inquiry approaches. All of those approaches tend to give student and students empowerment by giving them uh, choices over what to do and give them some self-direction. So those types of things are sort of inherently um, give students empowerment. Um, explaining the amount of control students have in a course, sometimes they don't even realize it. And you can point it out to them and say, hey, you have the choice of or when to do this assignment. Here's a due date, but you have these options or any of the multitude of things that they may have choice over. Sometimes pointing it out to them and making, aware, making them aware of it can help meet their need to feel autonomous. Don't give unnecessary rewards, especially if they feel controlling. So the idea here is you wanna avoid seeming like the controlling person because students tend to be less motivated when they feel controlled and manipulated. So if you have rules, like don't use your laptop in class, I don't know if that's a good rule or not for your class, but if you have that rule, you would at least wanna have a rationale for why. And it's not that you're just a controlling jerk, but <laughs> but it's a fact that you have a reason for it. And if you don't have a reason for it, why are you doing it? Are you just being a controlling jerk? And so again, I don't have an opinion on that necessarily, but that's for you to decide and think about. Um, here's an example that one instructor wrote. They said, I used to require students to rewrite lab reports that were below a B. So they used to require this. That resulted in a lot of whining from students. Now, I allow students to rewrite and I get a lot of gratitude. So sometimes framing things a little bit differently can make them realize that, oh, I do have empowerment and choice here and they're not just being a controlling jerk. But, but uh, so reframing things this way, it's the same effect, right? This teacher got what they wanted and hopefully students learn more as a result, but they shifted the motivational climate from one in which students felt oppressed because I have to do this the one in which, oh, I can do this? You, you're allowing me to do it? Great. And again, most of these ideas aren't my own. I'm putting them together in this uh, one model. And so the last point I have for you with empowerment strategies is, is the language and avoiding controlling language and allowing students to talk more. So there's two different things going on there. And again, if we had time, I could do a whole talk just on empowerment strategies and we could have a great workshop. Um, but for example, let me give you one example. How about saying this to a student or all students? You have to complete the assignment by the due date in the syllabus. If you don't, I'm going to deduct 10% of the points for each week that it's late. 
Okay, that's a reasonable thing to say, right? You're, you're setting expectations. There's nothing wrong with that. But these have two statements can sometimes come across as controlling and manipulative. So what, and again, these aren't my ideas, but people who study this say that another way to come up, go about this is to say something like, hey, the due date for the assignment shown in the syllabus, right? They still have the expectations and know what the requirements are. If you choose to complete the assignment after the due date, you're gonna lose 10% of the points for each week it's late. You're saying the same thing, you're just saying it differently, maybe, maybe in a, a more empowering way. Will this affect their motivation ultimately? Maybe not, but maybe. And, it, and over time, it starts to set a motivational climate that is more conducive to learning. And so that's what we're going for here. It's these little things and, and um, going through and checking your language and how you frame things can be very powerful. Um, so again, here you're talking about if you choose, you're giving them the choice, right? If you want to do it after the due date, it's your choice, but this is what's going to happen. Okay, that's empowerment in a nutshell. Let me give you the nutshell of usefulness is the you in the music. And the most obvious thing you can do is explain why what you're doing is useful, right? How is this useful to their lives? Uh, my eighth grade son asks me this every day when he's doing his algebra homework. Dad, this is never going to be useful. Um, and so having an answer to that can be very motivating to students. You're one person, but yeah, you have a PhD in this. Of course, you think it's useful. <laughs> so sometimes it can be useful to have other people explain why it's useful. How about a former student of yours? Maybe they do a short video, uh, you know, like a one minute TikTok type of video and say, hey, this course was really useful to me because da, 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 da and have them give their explanation. Or how about a professional in the field, have them either come to your class or do a short video or Zoom and say, hey, this is why this is important. Um, the things you're learning here may not seem important in isolation, but this is how I use them every day in my work. So again, these are sort of obvious, but if you start to implement some of these things, if you haven't been doing it, um, it can have a nice effect on the class. The third thing for usefulness is actually designing activities for usefulness that students can see firsthand how it's useful. Instead of just writing, maybe they're writing a blog or they're writing to someone, maybe they're writing to, uh, to an elected official about an issue that they're concerned about. Um, something like that where it's real world type of application. Those activities obviously can be seen as being very useful. And then finally, this doesn't work in all classes, but you can have students reflect on their goals. Why are you here? What are you trying to get out of your education? How does this fit with your, the goals that you've set um, for your life? And making them realize that sometimes they don't make those connections because they're students and they're, in the, they're taking classes, taking classes, taking classes, giving them a chance to reflect on why they're doing what they're doing and how this, these activities in your course fit into that can be powerful. Again, not every course needs to do this. These are some ideas that you can use to intersperse usefulness strategies. Okay, let's move on to success. Now, this is a big category. There's a lot going on in here, but one thing is to focus on effort. If you help students believe that they can succeed, and you may have be familiar with the growth mindset and fixed mindset. It's got a lot of press lately. And these are some good ideas based in educational psychology. The idea that intelligence can be developed. It's not totally intelligence isn't totally static or fixed that you can't change it or do anything about it. We can have a whole nother session on what intelligence is, but the point of the, this theory is that it's not what it is, it's how you interpret it. And if you believe that it's changeable, those students tend to desire to learn and are more likely to put forth effort and tackle challenges if they believe they can, quote unquote, get smarter. Um, I'll leave it at that for that. I like this quote too, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. And so the idea here is if you instill that in students, that can help them realize that, hey, learning, you're not learning if you're not failing, because you're not pushing yourself. And so developing that motivational climate in your class can be really powerful for, for some students. Um, supporting student success. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do this as well. Um, one thing I do is I give them a tips document of here's things you can do to succeed in this class. 
And one of my more genius things I've ever done, and I haven't done many of them, but this one was to ask the best students in my class what they were doing. And I would copy and paste that into a document and I would give that to students either that semester or the next semester, because I've never taken my class before. I don't know how to succeed in my class, but they do. And so by sharing those strategies, again, that's just one example of, hey, this is a student who's getting a high A in this class. If you wanna do well in this class, here are some things to do. And what the first time I did this, it was great because the first thing they said was, um, the most important thing to do in this class is to do all the readings. The readings are really important. You can sit there and say that all you want as an instructor, but as soon as a student says, oh, these readings are important, you know, they're more likely probably to pay attention um, if reading's important for your class. And so I found that to be very powerful and they've said it better than I do. And the other thing is if they decide not to get an A in the class, at least they know what they need to do. Like if they choose not to, then that's fine. If you don't wanna do all the readings, get, take your B or your C or whatever and move on, it's your life. But um, I'm giving you the support that, um, that's needed. Matching up the difficulty level of activities with their skill level is an important one. And this, a lot of this theory comes from flow theory and the work on by Csikszent Mihai has done where you're matching the challenge and skills. And you can see here on the 45 degree angle that when the challenge meets the skills, students tend to be engaged, they tend to be motivated. So you're more motivated when the challenge meets the skill. And I have a whole video online about this theory if you're more interested in these ideas. Another one is giving specific feedback, honest, specific feedback about where they are at regular intervals. So it's not something you just do once a semester. You need to give more feedback more often. That tends to keep students more motivated because they know where they are and if they're doing well or not doing well. And having explicit expectations is so important. Um, I hear it over and over again in students' comments about they don't know whether they can be successful if they don't know what the expectations are. And of course, that starts with your syllabus and goes on to your assignment instructions and, and so forth from there. So again, there's a a lot of strategies you can use that, that affect student success. Here are five sort of big categories, but within each of these, there's, there's plenty to do. Let's move on to the I, or the music model. I is related to interest. And so one thing you wanna do, interest incorporates um, the cognitive part, the attention. You're designing instruction that catches and holds students' attention. And so there's a lot of things, different things you can do for that. And I have some of those listed in my book. We don't have time to get into to all these strategies. Let me hit on some of the highlights here. That's for attention. Then there's curiosity. Are you really conveying what's, what's sort of interesting and what's, what gets people curious about your field? Sometimes it's something I don't do that well as an instructor and I know I need to, but sometimes I sit back and say, what are we doing today? Why? What would get students curious about this? Why are other people in my field curious about these things? What's, what's interesting about our field? What's going on right now? And so those types of things would fall under here. Sometimes these are only short term. You may get their interest for five or 10 minutes. And then, you know, these aren't necessarily things that are gonna last throughout the semester, but sometimes they can be a spark and other times they're just attention grabbers. And honestly, we need some of those, if, especially if you're gonna do a lot of lecture. Um, similarly, things that stimulate emotional arousal in students, so they get them excited. Sometimes there's things like debates or controversial topics and things like this where students get emotionally passionate about it, can talk to one another about, um, can lead to arousal. Other times, just having, uh, again, interesting and curious things about your field can get them emotionally excited about your class. But trying to intentionally think through, how can I do some of those things? can be important. And then lastly, individual interest. So what, is, what interest do students bring with them? An individual interest is something that lasts over time. It's something you tend to value and are interested in. If students already have some of those interests coming into your class, how can you build on them? Or if they don't even know what your field is so much, how can you start to develop um, their interest in your field? Okay, the C in the music model is for caring. It's a little bit obvious, but it may also be one of the most important things you can do um, in terms of five broad categories of things you can do. 
One is to simply consider accommodating students when they experience extraordinary events. I mean, how do you deal with students who have deaths in the family or have other serious um, things going on in their life? Uh, figuring out ways to accommodate them. And we could have a great discussion about that if we had more time, the best ways to do that. But I think listening to students and knowing that you're listening to them and you're trying to consider their perspective uh, will go a long way in helping to motivate students. Sometimes you need to help students fit in. Now this fits more with maybe some courses and some majors than others, but do they feel like they fit in the culture of the class? Do they feel like they fit maybe within your major if your course is part of a major or even at the, the college or university and helping them make those connections and helping connections within the class. And again, all of these, I have more strategies for each of these in my book and I'm not selling my book, it's free, available online and I'll give you the website. So when I say my book, I'm, this isn't a sales pitch. This is a, there, is, there are resources here that go deeper into each one of these for all of these categories. Um, obviously being approachable and relatable. Um, maybe this is one of the biggest ones with caring, simply respecting them, right? That, that you respect them and, and you expect them to respect you. It's a two-way street. And that happens in online too, and emails and other types of communications that we have with students. And then really showing that you care about whether they achieve the course objectives. So you're going out of your way sometimes to help them, or maybe it's not out of your way, it's you just recognize that it's part of your job to really help them in any way you can. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that for now because I do have more details here. And here, I'll give you this URL at the end and make this available, but um, my book is available for free. And there's one chapter in each of these related to each of the music model components where I've assembled a bunch of different strategies from uh, people who have used these types of things. But ultimately what we're trying to do is these, these five music components interact in ways that we can't always figure out as psychologists, but we know they're interacting and somehow that's creating a motivational climate. And the idea with the, the music model is that those five things are interacting, we're paying attention to them, we're intentionally designing for them, and that this motivational climate will then lead to a more inclusive and equitable environment for all students. Um, which is the ultimate goal to help all students, not just a few who happen to be good at whatever it is you're doing. Okay, so how do you use the music model to design, to intentionally design instruction? Well, first of all, you have your course objectives and sometimes you may select them and most often they're handed to you and this is the course and here's what you're gonna teach and here are your objectives. But usually you have some autonomy over selecting instructional strategies. But what I would push is to also think about music strategies. So while you're creating the instructional strategies, what type of approaches are you gonna use? How are you also integrating music strategies and considering those as you're making those design decisions? And then you're gonna teach the class. You're gonna try it out, implement the strategies. And then as part of the music model design cycle, you will assess students' perceptions. We wanna know, what. Do, do students find this empowering? Do they find it useful? And success and interest and caring? Um, let's find out. And then based on that, let's evaluate it. Are there any problems here? Or are things going pretty well? If things are going pretty well, then fine. Um, usually there's small tweaks you can make. I've taught some courses, um, I think 40 times over the past 23 years. And I'm still making changes to them because I still think they're little tweaks I can make. Sometimes for the better, sometimes it doesn't really change too much, but it keeps my interest. And so that's important too. We have to, think, sometimes we have to think about keeping ourselves engaged in our courses. And so again, this is a cycle like any design type of cycle that you might have seen or that you might all use in your own fields, where then you're going back again and, okay, what, what strategies do I need? How can I make changes? Um, but let's go back to this step about assessing students' perceptions. How, you know, how do you assess this? Brett, what, do you, what are you talking about here? Well, the idea again here is in our bigger model, um, there are ways to assess each of these five things here in the music model. Again, there's a lot of people around the country that are maybe assessing usefulness. Some are assessing success and interest. Some are um, assessing caring. 
different theories tend to focus on different uh, parts of these. And in the music model, the idea is I pulled them all together and say, let's look at, I think you need to look at all five. Now in some situations, some will be more important than others, but let's look at all five. Um, and so I ended up creating the music model of academic motivation inventory. And again, this is available for free at my website and you can download it. Um, and what that looks like is students, there's a lot of different versions. We've translated this to 14 different languages around the world uh, and people are using it in those countries and students rate your course. This is the 19 item version. We have longer versions, but the short version works pretty well. We just published an article that showed that this version was valid. Um, and so I like this one for undergraduates, especially where they rate themselves on a six point scale for each of these items. This is called the college student version. And what you have is, these are the 19 items here on the left. There's four items for empowerment that ask things like this. I have flexibility in what I'm allowed to do in this course. So strongly agree to strongly disagree. There's four items, you average them and get an empowerment score. You have four items for usefulness. In general, the coursework is useful to me. And so students will answer these, um, they'll, they'll answer the four items. These items are all mixed up. And then, so you pull them back out and here's one for success. I'm confident that I can succeed in the coursework. I enjoy the instructional methods used in the course and the instructor cares about how well I do. Typically we use, put the instructor in here for caring. Sometimes we ask the questions related to the instructor. Some, and we also say other students in the course care about how well. So we have two scales, one for the same questions. We just change the word from instructor to other students to get a feel for how they're interacting with other students. So you have these scales. And again, we have a lot of validity evidence and a lot of different samples. Here are 21 papers that just looked, that we published in referee journals that look at the, that have done a factor analysis where we put all these items in, you hit the factor analysis button. Some of you do statistics and know it's a little bit more complicated than that, but you know, not much. And uh, the computer then tells you, yes, these do actually separate into five different categories. So if you put all these items in randomly, they come out and load on each of these intended factors, which is really cool. And we have now at least 21 papers that just focus on um, trying to validate this instrument and show that these, so these five categories aren't just things I made up in my head. I pulled them from other researchers, but then now I have shown statistically that they are distinct empirically. So we can show with evidence quantitatively that they're different. That's pretty cool. So students do have these perceptions in your class. Sometimes they're all high in all of them. Sometimes they might be low. Sometimes there's a mix. But then as a result, you as an instructor can get your averages back and say, wow, you know, I'm pretty low here on empowerment and interest. Maybe those are two areas I want to work on first. It's hard to work on everything all the time. So you choose one or two of these and you start with those and you start to think about what you can do. Now, anything you do is going to affect all five of these. So it's not like, okay, I'm going to do this and it's just going to affect interest. Of course not. These five factors are correlated. And that's what you saw, actually, if I go back, these, these arrows here from the different um, components of the music model, they're correlated, absolutely. Some more than others and it depends on the situation, but they're correlated. So if you do something, it will affect all five of these, sometimes to a greater or lesser extent. And that's what part of my research is looking at this in different contexts, um, different cultures, different types of classes at different grade levels to figure out what those relationships are. And that's been a big part of my research. So for example, here, if empowerment and interest are lower, maybe you wanna think about how you could give students more choices or you wanna use activities that pique curiosity and stimulate emotional arousal. And yes, there are things you can do for usefulness, success and caring, but maybe you put those lower on the list and you really focus on two of them. Now, in addition to that quantitative um, scale, we also give open-ended items. Typically something like this, there's nothing written in stone about these, you can change these, but you know what could be changed in this course to make you feel you had more choices? What could be changed to make it more useful? What could be changed to help you feel you could be more successful? And when we do that, we find that we get some great ideas from students. 
We also get some bad ideas from students. And so you as a professional have to say, yeah, we're not gonna do that one. That's not a good idea. But here are some potentially good ideas. And I hadn't thought about these. Most often it's a type of thing where it's, you say, well, I have thought about that and maybe I should do that. And then you end up trying it out. So the qualitative components, the responses to these can also be very powerful. But here you're not just asking them, what can I do to motivate you? Which is very open-ended and often not that helpful. You're getting specific feedback about each of these five categories. And again, they'll give you things that will overlap with more than one of these five things. And that's okay. You're, you're drawing them out by asking them about five important aspects of the motivational climate. And so again, my point here was to say that that's how you design for instruction using the music model. You can also diagnose motivation problems. So if it's been a, a course you're teaching, you can go in and try to figure out what can we change and uh, to include more music model strategies. And so here we're talking about these uh, steps four and five, where you're gonna assess and then you're gonna evaluate and see, again, are there problems? And so to do that, you can get the means. That's great, that tells you something. You can look at the open-ended responses. Another thing we've done is that in one semester, we've surveyed students every three weeks. And so here you see five um, time points. Time one is at three weeks after the beginning of the course, then six, then nine, 12, and 15 at the end of the semester. And so you can start to look over time what's going on. So here we can see that overall interest is the lowest, followed by empowerment, and usefulness caring and success tend to be higher, but that over time they started out high and they sort of dropped at week two and leveled off. And so it gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, what I found a little bit more helpful than just picking random weeks is actually at the end of each unit. So maybe if you have eight chapters you do or 10 chapters, do it at the end of a chapter and ask them to respond only to that chapter. So in chapter two, I, I believe I could be I believe that it was useful. I believe I could be successful. And you ask the questions on the music inventory. That way you have these scores tied to specific activities and content that may vary from chapter to chapter. And it helps, helps you think about how you might um, teach it differently in the future. So these are class averages. So everybody in the class is averaged here. What's also interesting if you wanna reach all students is to look at some student averages. So student C is this blue line and student D, a different student, is the orange. And M means empowerment at time one, empowerment at time two. So you can see both students are fairly consistent over time. You know, there's a, well, actually there is some variation in the blue. It goes from about 5.4 down to 4.1. So they really dropped off. The other student went up. There was difference there for some reason. But overall empowerment is fairly close agreement for those two students compared to, look at the next usefulness, where clearly student C thought it was very useful. And student D wasn't so sure. <laughs> They're more in the middle. And so who are these students? Are they a different major? Are they a different gender or ethnicity? Are they a different, is there something else different about them? And can we start to try to figure out how is this course maybe biased towards some students or not as um, designed as well as it could be to motivate all students? And this is where I think you start to get into some cool things. Again, if you look at success for this class, they're in pretty fair agreement here that it's high. Um, if you look at interest, again, there's a disparity. So this student D is lower on usefulness and interest. So there's something going on there. And you see caring, there's a little bit of disagreement. They're both on the higher end, but there's some disagreement. So by, you can play around with these data in all sorts of different ways. And we've started to do that in different classes now to try to figure out if we can find some patterns over time. Another thing you can do, this is from a different published study in the Journal of Educational Psychology, where these, um, these points represent averages. Well, let me say the colors are clusters. So we found that there's a group of students who rate, these are their averages, the students in that cluster are all high. They tend to have high empowerment, usefulness, success, interest, and caring. They think the motivational climate is pretty good. They rate it pretty high. There's another group down here um, on the bottom who doesn't agree and they're lower. And so statistically, we were able to put students in these groups. And then we plotted the means here to show you the difference. 
this green line is sort of in the middle straight across, but what's sort of interesting is this purplish um, one that goes up and down. So you see that those students, and again, there might be 100 students in this group. We had 900 students in this sample. So there may be 100 students in the purple group. There may be you know, 200 in the green group. You can see how many students are in each cluster, but then you can also say, well, these purple um, students were high on success and caring, but lower on usefulness and interest. You know, who are they? Are they, are there, is there any pattern there or is it just dispersed, uh, you know, equally throughout our sample? Are there students in chemistry who are this way, but the students who are in chemical engineering are this way. And so maybe we're not meeting, reaching the chemical, the engineers, but we're hitting on the, the chemistry students or, you know, whatever the, uh, whatever your students are into. Okay. I'm, just about out of time. I think I have about uh, maybe just a couple minutes here. So let me finish up here with about how to diagnose motivation problems. Well, that, I'm sorry, that was how to diagnose motivation problems. The last thing I was going to leave you with is a couple of research studies just to show you well, how do you research this? What types of things are you doing? Um, we have a music model research lab, and I have a, our 50 some publications that we've done in the last few years at themusicmodel.com on our website. One interesting study just to say, you know, does this have any validity? What is this related to? And a top journal here, AERA Open, an online journal that you can get for free. We had almost 3000 undergraduate students from 30 classes. And what we found was that the music perceptions uh, related to this using the music inventory predicted 89% of the score in the instructor rating that the students gave the instructor. And if you look at the course rating, these, these alone, these five characteristics predicted 93% of course rating. So if you're wondering how to improve your instructor or course ratings, these five things will almost explain all of your course ratings. And what's really interesting is if you control, if we put in the model, um, this is a hierarchical linear modeling we did. If you put in gender, race, class size and class ease, we can explain almost 100% of the variance in these, these course ratings and instructor ratings just by these five and controlling for these, these variables. So it's definitely predicting something. We think it's, you can go a long way with improving your motivational climate by focusing on these based on data like this. Um, in another study, we looked at computers and education open. Um, we looked at relationships between their course perceptions, effort, and achievement. And here we found that while all five music components were correlated with effort, that interest and caring were really two of the most important ones. And this is in an online geography class, a large online geography class. So that's one pattern. And if their effort then did predict their grade, although this value is pretty small, um, that these two were the most important, interest and caring. And the only way that you can know that is by putting all five of these in. If, you're, if your study only includes usefulness and success variables and doesn't include the others, then you're not gonna, you wouldn't know that interest and caring were important. And so that's why I promote including all five of these variables as part of the motivational climate to see what's going on. Because for example, in another study that we published in Social Psychology of Education, we found in a psychology course that when we looked at a similar model, empowerment and usefulness were the two that were significant predictors of cognitive engagement, which then predicted behavioral engagement, which then predicted learning. So what we're trying to do now in our research is to say, we still think all five of these things are important in all contexts for the motivational climate. But in terms of engagement and effort, some of them may be more important in some contexts and courses than others. And so that's um, part of our work, what we're, what we're doing now, but we use the music model to design, diagnose, and to do research. And we have, uh, people are using it. These are just the countries I know about, the ones in color. We do have someone at, um, at, in Edinburgh using it who contacted me and wanted to use the music inventory. So I know they're using it over there. Um, I'll leave you with this and then leave time for questions here. Here's my email. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about any of this. Um, my website with a bunch of free materials. And again, again, all this is free. I'm not trying to make money off of this. And I've always promoted my stuff to try to, my main goal is to try to improve instruction at all levels as an educational psychologist. And that's what they pay me to do at Virginia Tech. And so that's what I try to do to the best of my ability. So.
Let me know if you have any questions and I'll turn it over to Carolina here at this point. Thank you so much, Brett. Yes, um, thank you for this talk and all the resources that you shared and explaining the model. Um, we have actually one question in the chat um, by Mina. Mina, uh, I'm going to just read out your, um, your question, but you can also just hop on and um, turn on your camera uh, if, you, if you like. So she's asking um, regarding environmental condition, can we consider the built um, environment, oops, sorry, the built uh, environment characteristic, architecture and interior design furnishing impacting on motivation? Oh, that's a good question. I have a colleague who's looking at that more and I told him I wanted to work with him on this. So yes, we haven't done that in our work, but certainly I think what that would affect well, it could affect the actual instruction and how students interact. So it could affect things like caring. It may most, um, it may affect interest more than anything. In other words, do you like being there? Do you have a positive affect? Does it make you feel good to come there? And so how does the environment affect how you feel about being there? And certainly if it's, it's a, not a nice place to be um, and things look old or dingy, um, you're probably not going to be as motivated and as engaged, but I don't have data to support that yet. But my intuition is that that is the case. And I always focus on that in my own classes when I set them up. And, you know, we're limited. You kept, you're in the classroom you're in most of the time. But I do, I do think it is, it's important. I just don't have data to support exactly how. But that would affect mostly, I think, the interest component in terms of the music model types of things. But it could affect some other things as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, there is a comment by Dustin. Um, so, so perhaps having a highly structured course takes away agency from the student to proceed through a course as they wish. I'm talking about examples that force students to click through a series of materials rather than allowing exploration, dipping in and out, and so on. So I guess. Yeah. So I have. <laughs> so this is good. This relates to. Can you? Oh. It stopped. Let me do a, let me connect you back up. Um, Cause I have a, I actually have a slide on this. So you're right. And I think it's a balance. It's almost like a, a seesaw. Let me share. So we don't have to worry about the context of this particular example, but I had this slide where if you increase empowerment or, okay, look, this is actually sort of the opposite of the case you gave. But I think these two things have to be balanced because if you increase empowerment and give students too many choices, sometimes they feel like they can't succeed, right? Because it's, it's too much. I don't know, what do you want me to do? Just tell me. Um, because they feel like they don't have enough skills to be successful. So in that case, teachers need to provide support here to keep the perceptions of success. Now you're sort of saying the opposite. If it's too structured and expectations are too narrowly defined, that success may be really high, but then all of a sudden your empowerment drops. And so again, for some students that may be okay. In the music model, we'd say, how can we find a nice balance? And that's why we've been using complexity theory to understand the music model, because we know these things interact in complex ways. And this is just one example of that. How do we find that nice balance of not too structured, and not too loose because either way, the motivational climate isn't gonna be quite right for all students. And obviously some students will want it more one way probably than another. And finding that sweet spot is, can be difficult unless they're all like introductory students in, in Calc 1 and none of them have had Calc before. And then you sort of know where you are. But if you have a mix of students, it can be difficult. So yes, I agree with your assessment that you would be, you would be balancing those two things. Does that answer the question? I think it addresses the comment, yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, good point. Yeah, um, we have a question uh, by Karen. Um, are there studies of teachers' motivation and engagement related to their use of the model? Yes, we have some, not many. So one thing, so absolutely, we can use the music model to motivate teachers. One of my colleagues in math Actually, she works in K to 12 education. So she had was trying to use the music model to see how their professional development for teachers would actually motivate teachers to implement some of their changes. So we have used it with teachers. The other thing that people often ask is, um, do teachers' perceptions align with students' perceptions? And so you can measure both. And so in my book, and it's in the um, user guide as well, 
uh, there's a scale for professors to take. So sometimes I'll start with a faculty member and say, I want you to complete the inventory. How do you think students perceive these things? So you get teachers' perceptions of it, and then you can compare that to the students. And I've been doing this for a while. And if you look at my scores, I can get it pretty close to what students think. I have pretty good intuition about this now that I've done it long enough. Um, and most instructors are pretty good. So there's that. I don't know if that's what you're asking or if you're asking the former, which is, yes, we can see what motivates teachers. It's these same five things, right? So how do you create an environment for teachers or faculty where they feel empowered and they feel like they can be successful and that they're interested in what they're doing and that they think it's useful? So yes, you can use a model with the teachers as well. Absolutely. We haven't done as much work in that area, but it's absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen, does it answer your question? Um, I think you said more the former. Um, let me know that was addressed. Yeah, and, um, so, and, and often I work with K-12 uh, field as well, and that the administrators will often come to me and say, how do I motivate my teachers? So it's mm -hmm. these same types of issues you're dealing with. And we see in America where standardized testing has really pushed down the empowerment of teachers. They no longer feel like they have autonomy and choices. And it's driven a lot of teachers out of teaching and it's, it's been a problem for sure. And there, it's not a mystery as to why, it's because we have a need to feel autonomous to some extent. And if you take too much of it away, it's a problem, so. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments for Brett at this point? You can also raise your hand if you, if you like and come on camera, it's up to you. Um, or if you're typing, I will wait a bit um, for any kind of, ah, Dustin, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say thanks. Yeah, it's, this is a good way to look at, uh, to complement learning design or de design for learning, uh, because within the university, for example, where we work, we often use Moodle and people don't, some don't understand the importance of signposting. But even when they get that, they may not get that you still need the empowerment, the engagement, uh, or uh, where we don't use Moodle because some of our colleagues use something called Articulate Rise. It's a very linear format of learning where you just click through and you're kind of forced to click through. That That's where my comment came from. It takes away from the empowerment side of things mm -hmm. because if you have ADHD, uh, you might want to jump around and explore and then you know uh, which is what I sometimes do myself but yeah. a very linear highly structured way of doing things can be very kind of takes away the empowerment and agency yeah, and, and I agree and the interest right so just interest one thing we know that one of the biggest things you can do to increase interest is have variety <laughs> and so that's what you're getting at if you're just going through linearly and there's not it's okay if it's a linear path and there's variety along the way, like, okay, that's kind of cool. Like if you're scrolling through TikTok, you can do it for hours, some people, because it's different every time you scroll. But if it's the same thing or it's very similar in terms of format, and kind of, uh, yeah, we get bored. So yeah, good point. Yeah. Thank you, thanks. Any other comments or questions? We will have again, um, we will do a short blog post on this talk, um, add the recording on there as well, and also all the resources, links, and so on, and the slides um, on there as well. So everything will be in one place on the Tile Network website for you know further exploring um, the resources and so on. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, say thank you now, Brett, for uh, joining us as a speaker and for the audience for their questions and comments. And uh, we're looking forward to our final uh, tile talk in um, this year in December. So make sure to join that. And um, thank you very much. Super, thank you. I appreciate it.